One of the biggest mistakes I see producers and mix engineers make is they don't have enough clarity and punch in the low end. Things are just too muddy and it's one of the biggest telltale signs of an amateur mix. And the funny part is this can actually be solved pretty simply with just a few simple steps. And so in this video, I'm gonna show you the steps that I always take to fix a muddy mix and get some clarity and punch back in the low end of my tracks. So let's listen to the track I have here. So this track is sounding great right now, but it didn't always sound like this. So I'm gonna show you what I did to make this track have a nice, tight, crisp, and clear, and punchy low end. So step one, focus. We need to create focus and know what to focus on. And so the first thing a lot of people don't understand is that 50 hertz and 100 hertz is an octave apart, but one kilohertz and two kilohertz is also an octave apart, two to four, four to eight, eight to 16, so on and so forth. As the waveform gets slower, it's easier to create a jumbled mess of sounds in the low end. Having a few conflicting sounds in the high end isn't necessarily the end of the world, but a few conflicting sounds towards 50 to 100 hertz can destroy a mix. So we need to choose what to focus on. So let me show you what I did in this track to create focus. One of the best ways I found to be able to hear what's going on in the low end is obviously spending more time. The more you do this, the more you're going to be able to find those frequencies that are going to start to poke out to you. But one of the best things I've ever found to be able to listen to the low end clearly is called the coat room trick. The coat room trick is basically an EQ on your master bus after everything else. And what you do is you put a low pass or a high cut on and you slowly drag this down until you're around 300 hertz. The idea is you just wanna focus on the low end. So now let's listen to the song. And if you're not listening on headphones or a nice set of speakers, definitely grab some headphones or listen on your speakers. Phone speakers are not gonna cut it for this part. So during this part here, I can tell that there's a little bit of an issue. Every time the kick hits, things start to wobble out of place a little bit. Let's listen to that again. Things are starting to wobble out of place just a touch. So I need to create focus. I have three separate layers going on in the low end down here. The first I have is of course the drums. Next up, I have a gritty bass. And next we have an 808. So now I need to choose what I want to focus on in the low end. And I chose for this song, the kick. Remember that layering is not always your friend. And when we do layer, we want to layer along the frequency spectrum. We don't want to just layer one frequency on top of another frequency or else we're going to get a bunch of buildup. And that's usually where a lot of that mud comes from. Things sound great in solo, but when you start blending multiple sounds together, they start to create a lot of buildup at certain frequencies and things start to sound muddy and you lack clarity and punch. So I'm choosing to make the kick the main primary low end element. But this is also a problem because the bass brings in a lot of steady and consistent low end, while the kick only hits once every time it's hit. Very transient heavy. Now one more thing I wanna point out here is I am only using one sound for the kick. I'm only using one sound for the snare. I'll open sessions with my students all the time and I will see 15 to 20 different snare layers and six and seven different kick layers and eight and nine different bass layers. And they're wondering why things aren't sounding great. And I turn off 90% of those layers and things immediately start sounding better. I would rather you take the time to choose one really good sound than try to layer 10 other sounds on top of one another. Layering definitely has its place, but most of the time you'd be best served if you just chose one sound. This is just one kick. And then one snare sample. And the whole drum kit with the room mics. So you don't need a ton of layers to get an incredible sound. So now I need to deal with these bases over here. Now that I've chose the kick as my primary low end element, now I need to take care of the bass and the 808. And so that's step two, elimination. You want to eliminate anything that's getting in the way of your main sound. Now that we've accomplished step two and we really only have a few elements left in the low end, now we wanna go on to step three, which is enhancement. There's still a bit of fighting going on in the low end and I need to take care of that with a little bit of mixing. And I'm gonna do a little bit of creative mixing here. So this grit bass, I'm going to throw on an EQ 
and I'm going to make it a dynamic EQ. And I need to find out where the kick is hitting most of the time. So I'll go to the kick, I'll turn on the EQ, and let me listen and see where that kick is hitting. So right about there, right around 75 hertz. Every time the kick hits, 75 hertz is being spiked up. There's other frequencies right around it, but 75 seems to be right about the main part of that kick. The main punch of that kick is around 75 hertz. So now I'm going to take the bass and I'm going to throw on a dynamic EQ. And I want to cut that 75 hertz. And I only want to cut it every time the kick hits. So I'm going to sidechain this EQ to the kick of my kit. And so every time the kick hits, 75 hertz is going to be ducked by around 4 dB on the bass track. It's already sounding a bunch better. And if you don't have a dynamic EQ, you can actually just cut it statically or you can automate that cut every time the kick hits. That is a lot of work though. Another trick I use quite often is using a compressor. I will also trigger that to the kick and I will turn the entire bass track down every time the kick hits. So you can kind of hear that bass ducking out of the way of that kick. That's what sidechain compression can do as well. Personally, for this track, I thought it sounded best with a bit of dynamic EQ sidechained to the kick. Now, I also have that 808 that's going on here, and I like this different stylistic sound of the 808 and that gritty bass together, but they don't fit in the track together, and I have to make sure that I'm keeping room for that kick to come through the mix. So I did the same thing here. I am sidechaining this dynamic EQ to the kick drum, and I am turning this one down by almost 8 dB every time the kick hits, right around 75 hertz. And now the last little bit of enhancement that I want to do is a bit of saturation on that 808 to get it to cut through small phone speakers. So I'm going to run it through just a little bit of saturation. Just to give it a little bit of grit and a little bit of punch. So now let's listen to the low end on the entire track again and see if we can hear things fighting again. One extra bonus of being able to get a clear and punchy low end is you can actually get a louder master as well. Take a look at how loud this mix is right now. And that's just something you could not do if you didn't have a clear and tight punchy low end. If you like this, you're gonna love my free workshop on mixing vocals. I go from start of recording vocals all the way to mixing them into a track so they don't sound super awkward. It's completely free, it's about 45 minutes long. You're gonna love it. I will leave the link down in the description below so you can watch that now. Otherwise, you can watch the three levels of music production. Which level are you at? I'll see you in the next one. Now as always, go create.